The song that we're going to do is about his resurrecting power. So would you like to join us in standing and singing with us?
Ok. to our guests this morning. Glad you could be here. Got some significant things happening. We're celebrating uh, our risen Lord this morning. He is risen. Is risen. Awesome. Uh, the significance of the resurrection. Without a resurrected Lord, we do not have a faith. So we have a resurrection. We have faith. We have a salvation. Uh, this morning we also have celebrating two baptisms this morning. It's great because I was out in the sa out in the foyer. We're just visiting, and I had a gentleman come up with his son, and well, he wants to be baptized this morning. And I'm like, hey, awesome, great, cool. So that was a surprise, but that's a good surprise. So, uh, but anyways, let's get to our announcements really quickly, and what we have coming up. Uh, Band of Brothers uh, on Sunday. Uh, this past this past uh, Saturday, we had uh, 27 guys out, so that's awesome. So, uh, so the next next one is in two weeks. Please sign up. And please sign up, yeah, because uh, uh, the cooks were caught a little bit unaware, so there was a few guys that are a little bit slimmer that day, but uh, that's okay. That's okay. Next one, uh, game night is Friday, April 5th, 6 p.m. at the church. So make sure you plan for that. That's it. that's it? Well, that's it. Well, awesome. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for the day that we get to celebrate. Lord, we thank you for this season. We thank you for this Passover Sunday that we get to celebrate. I agree, Shannon. Yes. Thank you, Greg. And Father, we, <laughs> we praise you, we give you glory, we give you thanks. Holy Spirit, move amongst us this morning as we celebrate 
our risen King and Savior. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well-framed of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him. And you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Yeah! like to come up, please. I think you know this one well. We're going to let Tom minister to you this morning with this song. Wow, that was some kind of video. That's hard to follow. The Lord is what you follow. The song is called Then Came the Morning. <clears throat> they all walked away, nothing to say. They just lost their dearest friend. And all that he'd said, now he was dead. So this was the way it would end. The dreams that they had dreamed were not what they seemed. Now that he was dead and gone, the garden, the jail, the hammer, the nail, how could
could a night be so long? Then came the morning, night turned into day. The stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn. Then came the morning, shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost and life had won, for morning had come. The angel of star, the kings from afar, the wedding, the water, the wine. Now it was done, they'd taken her son, wasted her before his time. She knew it was true, she'd watched him die too. She'd heard them call him just a man. But deep in her heart, she knew from the start, somehow her son would live again. Then came the morning, night turned into day. The stone was rolled away, hope rose with the dawn, and then came the morning. Shadows vanished before the sun, death had lost and life had won, a poor morning had come, then came the morning. Shadows vanished before the sun. Death had lost and a life had won. For morning had come. Amen. I think that song says it all, doesn't it? You like to stand with us. Let's celebrate.
In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights
When I was nine years old, we moved to the United States uh, from Jerusalem. And the number one song in the country was Anne Marie, One Day at a Time, Sweet Jesus. And I'll never forget, my mom comes into the car and I'm like, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. My mom says, what did you say? My mouth. And I said, I'm singing the song. She's like, L'ombrim Jesus. We don't say Jesus. But why? In Hebrew, she says, Ze Yeshu. I grew up not being able to say that name. My son, at the age of five, was diagnosed with Asperger's. He was not verbal. He was very distant. He was the cause of me going back to school and becoming a special education teacher. I knew a lot about science. I studied a lot about everything, but I really never even opened the Bible. Ironically, I was teaching Hebrew school as a side job, teaching the prayers, teaching the liturgy. I mean, I knew everything. I, I had seen my father pray the prayers and put on the talid, and, and I know all of the rhetoric and everything that you know, goes along with being Jewish, but I didn't feel any connection to God. I would sit at synagogue and I tried to feel something. I tried to feel God. And it wasn't, it was like the Chagall stained glass windows and everybody around me and the Bima and the Ark and the Torah being taken out. And I felt, I remember feeling nothing. At my school, I worked at an after school program and there was a woman um, that had wrote, written a book called, Jesus, Can I Talk to You? So she said to me, I don't have money to hire an editor. Would you help me edit my book? And I said, well, I don't know anything about Jesus. So I do know about writing. I know about English. I know about commas. I know about semicolons. I just don't know anything about Jesus. It was a lot of stuff from the Old Testament. And I'm like, um, and, and I would see things like, you know, uh, this is from Ecclesiastes, or this is from, you know, Samuel or Kings. And I was like, these are our, our books. This came from the Jewish Bible. I never read the Bible. I read about the fact that he would be pierced. And that's exactly what happened to Jesus. And for the first time, the Bible came alive to me. And it's Isaiah 53. And, you know, I said, how can you miss this? It's like right there. It's right there in the scripture. In our, in our book, saying the prayer and asking for him to come into my life, and I accepted him as my savior, even though I just became a believer in the Jewish Messiah, but in Jesus, whose name I can't even say at the private Jewish school. Whoa, this is too weird. The grandson of the head of our Judaics program, and the first year that he was there, he you know, would talk to me and, and I would say, oh, it's time to go to tefillah. You know, students were required to go to prayer and you must go to tefillah. He's like, I hate tefillah. I'm like, your grandfather is the head of the Judaic program of the school. And so he comes up and he puts a keep on my head and he's like, you're like a rabbi because rabbi in Hebrew means teacher. He goes, I could just see it. One day you're going to become a Hasidic. And I said, no, 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 Joshua. <laughs> totally the furthest thing I'm going to become. He says to me, he goes, I don't understand you. What kind, like, do you keep Shabbat? What kind of a Jew are you? What do you mean, what kind of a Jew am I? And he goes, there's something different about you. There's, I don't know what it is. There's something different about you. And I said, Joshua, sit down. I really respect you. And I'm going to tell you uh, what's different about me is that I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And his eyes got wide and he stood up and he pointed at me. He's like, I knew it, I knew it. You're, you're always talking about love and stuff. And, and, and the students know, they know. I, I can talk about God all day. See, I couldn't do that in public school. Public school, you can't talk about God. But at a private Jewish school, I could talk about God all day. And you know, sometimes they'll, they'll go, you know, they, they test me and, and sometimes I get really close and they really question, like, what am I really saying? But if they ever come to me and say, what do you really believe, like Joshua does or did, I would tell them, I believe that Jesus is my Messiah. Coming out of the Messianic closet, that's pretty much a good way to put this. I'm, I've gone against, completely against the grain. You know, when you go against the grain, like, you get splinters. 
It's not easy. It's not been an easy path for me, especially knowing what I know and hearing what I hear, how the rabbis talk about him, how the students mock him. And I say, okay, I'm here for you. I want to stay here. You know, and people ask me, aren't you afraid if they find out at your school that you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that you'll get fired? And I'm like, so God will always provide. He has through everything, and he always delivers. He took it on the cross for me. Jesus died so that I could be born again. The greatest pain is to give up your own child. How much God must have loved us to give up his only son for us. It is. It is, Greg, for sure. Can you believe that they can't talk about God in an Israel public school? But you can talk about God in a Jewish Israel school. But this morning we got a testimony. That, as great as that testimony is this morning, we got a couple of testimonies from some of our children this morning. Uh, we're going to be baptizing Calvin and Abby. And Abby's getting baptized this morning. So, um, Calvin, I've just met this morning, and his dad, Nathan. So, and Calvin came and, and introduced himself. Nathan introduced himself and said, my son wants to be baptized. And Calvin took the reins and told me exactly what I needed to know and to hear. <laughs> so that's awesome. So we're going to baptize him this morning as well. Um, and Abby's going to get baptized. And Abby, are you changed and ready to go? You are. Awesome. Cool. Well, so I'm going to ask uh, Calvin, why don't you come up here? Come on up. And uh, since I've just met you, but you were here last week and I wasn't here last week. His dad let me know, but uh, um, you are a follower and believer of Jesus, are you? Yes. Yes? Just turn around here. We'll, we'll get you turned this way. You can look at these fine looking people out here. <laughs> but... Um, and it's your desire to follow him in baptism? Yes. And it's your choice? Yes. Awesome. And do you have a little bit of a testimony about uh, you following Jesus for us this morning? Um, sure. Um, let me say it. Yeah, okay. go ahead. Um, you mean testimony like how I did it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was an atheist for five years, and I, my dad was scary. Um, we learned about end times and that brought me closer to God and eventually it got me to go back to church and like believe in them more and be closer to God and I just have been praying and everything and I want to be closer to him and show God I believe in him. I want to be closer to him. I want to be beside Jesus Christ. I want all my sin to die. Amen. Awesome. Well, I'm going to get your dad to come up. Your dad has a few words for you this morning as well. Well, I'm very proud of Calvin. He's changed lots in the last six, seven months. And I'm glad that he wants to come and, and dedicate his life to Jesus. Public declaration, showing his faith. We've had lots of times where he would say to make us angry that he didn't believe in, in God and stuff like that. But now I believe that he really does. And we, we've had lots of reading of the Bible. And he's very scared of the end days. So we want to make sure that we get things in before... The second coming comes. Yes. Amen. 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 Awesome. Very good. Well, uh, Calvin, I'm going to get you to do is, and I'm going to get you to come over here, around here to the back. And uh, you're going to step down here. There's a little platform there. So uh, why don't you give me your hand? Take your other foot first. Yeah, there you go. This is going to be interesting. There you go. And then what I'm going to get you to do is you're going to step down into that. And then just don't hit that plug there. We've had an unfortunate accident before. 
And then you can just take a seat, just sit down like that. So, and dad, you can come on over here. You can meet him on the back here if you want. But uh, Calvin, upon your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's your desire to follow him in the waters of baptism, that you desire to be closer to him and have a deeper and richer commitment and relationship with him, I baptize you in the name of the so Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Don't touch the power cables. You'll be fine. <laughs> <Get electrocuted. laughs> the next one to come up is Abby. Abby, why don't you come on up? I want to get you to stand up here with me, uh, up, up here, so people can see you and you can see them. So, so you and I have had lots of chats together, haven't we? We've been meeting for about, I don't know, you can, you can grab that. We've been meeting for about the last two months, haven't we? Yeah. And you came to me, and it wasn't from your mom going, you need to be baptized. You told your mom that you wanted to be baptized, right? Yeah. So you tell me, if you can tell the people, why do you want to be baptized? Because I love Jesus and I follow him. Awesome. Now, what, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Who is Jesus for you? He's our king and our ruler. Awesome. He's our king, he's our ruler. And what does baptism mean? It's a symbol of new life and death. Awesome. Great. And so it is completely your choice to follow Jesus. Yes. Awesome. You have a little uh, something you want to tell us? Yes. After calling the crowds together with his disciples, Jesus said to them, All who want to come after me must say no to themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Mark 8, 34. Awesome. Very good. Well, I think your mom has something she wants to share with you this morning as well. Okay. <laughs> Oh, this is good. I can't see anybody. I don't have my glasses on. <laughs> um, no, because I'm crying. <laughs> so, Abby, I'm very, very excited for you. I'm so grateful that you want to be baptized. Awesome. I just have a verse that I would like to share with you. It is Romans 5, or Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, Mom, you can come on the back here. You're going to get, Abby, you're going to come to the back here. And you're going to take a big step. There we go. And I feel, I, I, you're going to, Come over here. It is cold, isn't it? It is cold. You know why it's cold? So you remember it. <laughs> All right. So what you're going to do is you're going to sit down a little bit. Right there. Are you okay? Okay. We'll make it quick, okay? Abby, upon your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. There you go. There you go. You did it. You did it. Good job. Good job. Good job. How was that? You can go that way. Now you can get warm. All right. And at this time, our kids can be dismissed to Sunday school this morning. Thanks very much.
If you have your Bibles with you, if you want to turn to Matthew chapter 28 this morning, we're going to have a reading, Matthew chapter 28. And would you mind standing, please? Would you mind standing? Matthew chapter 28. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised. As he said, come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead. And indeed, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. While they were going, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests everything that had happened. After the priests had assembled with the elders, they devised a plan to give a large sum of money to the soldiers, telling them, You must say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story is still told among the Jews to this day. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Charles Spurgeon, the renowned preacher, once said this, The resurrection of Jesus is the cornerstone of our faith. It is the decisive work of God in Christ, which assures of us of his victory over sin and death and certifies his rule, sovereign rule over the world. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a pivotal event that should evoke a deep sense of gratitude within us. It is the ultimate demonstration of God's love and power, a moment forever that forever shifted the trajectory of human history. As we delve into the story of Mary Magdalene, we can glean insights into the profound sense of thankfulness that the resurrection can inspire in us. Mary Magdalene was one of the first witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus. Imagine her awe and gratitude as she encountered the risen Christ. She had been with Jesus during his ministry, had witnessed his crucifixion, and now she was among the first to see him resurrected. The magnitude of this event must have stirred in her an overwhelming sense of thankfulness. This thankfulness was not just for the miracles, the miracle of Jesus' resurrection itself, but also for what it signified. The resurrection was a confirmation of Jesus' divinity and the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation. It was a testament to God's power over death, a beacon of hope for eternal life. For Mary Magdalene and all believers, the resurrection is a reason to be profoundly thankful. In our own lives, the resurrection should inspire a similar sense of gratitude. 
We may not have been there to witness the event like Mary Magdalene, but its implications are just as significant for us. The resurrection is the foundation of our faith, the assurance of our salvation, and the promise of eternal life. It is a reminder of God's immense love for us, a love so great that he gave his one and only son to conquer sin and death on our behalf. Moreover, the resurrection is a source of hope and strength in our daily lives. It assures us that no matter what challenges we face, we serve a God who has power over death itself. This knowledge should fill us with gratitude and inspire us to live our lives in a way that honors God. Jesus has power over death itself. The resurrection also calls us to be thankful for the community of believers that we are part of. We are gathered here this morning to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, to remember what he did and look forward to his return. Just as Mary Magdalene was not alone in her experience, we too are part of a community of faith. We share in the joy of the resurrection and we support each other in our faith journey. This sense of community is another reason for us to be thankful. We're not just together because we gather together just for a Sunday because we are like-minded or likeness. We gather together because Jesus has been resurrected. Because Jesus is our Savior. Because we believe that Jesus is who he claimed to be and who scripture proclaims him to be. He is Lord and Savior. He is Messiah. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the Alpha, the Omega. He is God. Amen? Amen. However, being thankful is not always easy. There are times when we may struggle, struggle with doubt, with fear, with disappointment, and there surely has been. In these moments, it's important to remember the resurrection. Just as it transformed Mary Magdalene's life, it can transform ours. The resurrection is a reminder of God's faithfulness and his power to bring about change it is a source of hope and a reason to be thankful even in the midst of challenges even like the lady that we just watched give her testimony she is hebrew she is jewish she's born a, born and in, born into the traditions of the jewish religion and she wasn't allowed to say Yeshua. She wasn't allowed to pronounce the name Jesus. She didn't even understand that Jesus was her long-promised Messiah. And then she tells the story of helping a lady edit her book. And she slowly discovers that the stories that are in this book that this lady is writing are stories from her own Torah, from her own Old Testament. And wait a second, who is this? And it's referring back to Jesus. And she comes and she proclaims Jesus is her Messiah. There's something different about you. I know it. Tell me what it is. Jesus is her Messiah. Is he your Messiah? Yes, he is. is he your risen Lord this morning? Yeah. The impact of the resurrection on Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was often misunderstood, misrepresented. But she was one of the most faithful followers of Jesus. She was the first to witness the empty tomb and the risen Christ. A privilege that forever changed her life. Why is that significant? Because she went and testified that Jesus was alive, but she was a woman. And in the Hebrew culture, in Hebrew society, a woman's testimony was not received. It was not to be believed. Only upon the witness of two or three was a witness to believe. And Jesus chose to reveal himself to who? To a woman. 
to Mary Magdalene. What a privilege she must have felt. The resurrection of Jesus brought about a radical transformation in Mary Magdalene's understanding of who Jesus was. She had followed him. She had witnessed his miracles. She had heard his teachings. But it was at the empty tomb in the presence of the angel and later Jesus himself that she fully comprehended the divine nature of who Jesus was. She realized that Jesus wasn't just a great teacher or a prophet, but the Son of God who had conquered death. She'd never seen that before. Have you ever seen that before? This revelation was so profound that it compelled her to go and share the news with the disciples, becoming the first evangelist of the resurrection. She carried the first story of Jesus' resurrection. And we read what? The disciples didn't believe her. They didn't believe her. And Jesus appears amongst them and they still, who is this? This must be an apparition. It must be a ghost. Thomas even goes, I won't believe unless what? I put my hand in his side and I put my fingers in the nail marks in his hands. I won't believe. Mary believes like that. The resurrection of Jesus gave Mary Magdalene a new purpose and a mission. She was entrusted with the message of the resurrection, a message of hope and victory over sin and death. This mission propelled her into a life of bold proclamation that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah, despite the skepticism and disbelief that she initially faced. The resurrection of Jesus provided Mary Magdalene with a deep sense of hope and joy. In the face of loss and despair, the resurrection was a beacon of hope that death was not and is not the end. Amen. 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 It was a joyous affirmation that Jesus had indeed fulfilled his promise of eternal life. The impact of the resurrection on Mary Magdalene is beautifully encapsulated in the words of theologian N.T. Wright. The resurrection completes the inauguration of God's kingdom. It is the decisive event demonstrating that God's kingdom really has been launched on earth as it is in heaven. The message of Easter is that God's new world has been unveiled in Jesus Christ and that you're now invited to belong to it. Yes. What a privilege. Just as the resurrection transformed Mary Magdalene's life, it continues to invite us into God's new world, a world marked by hope, joy, and the transformative power of God's love. It challenges us to rethink our understanding of Jesus. It compels us to share the good news and fills us with a joy that transcends our circumstances. The joy that Greg has this morning. You betcha. The resurrection indeed is the cornerstone of our faith, just as it was for Mary Magdalene. This leads us into our last point, the impact of the resurrection on us today. What impact does the resurrection of your Messiah have on you today? Are you living that way? Are we living that way? Yes. Are we living with hope, joy, and faith? And most importantly, love. The resurrection of Jesus is the ultimate demonstration of God's power over sin and death and gives us the assurance that we too will experience resurrection and eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus gives us hope for our own resurrection. As believers, we have the assurance that death is not the end. Hallelujah. 
Just as Jesus was raised from the dead, we too will be raised to eternal life. This hope gives us the courage to face the trials and tribulations of this life, knowing that our future is secure in Christ. Amen. If you want assurance of this, go home and read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The Apostle Paul will lay it right on the line for you. The Apostle Paul was who? He was Saul. And Saul did what? He persecuted the church. He persecuted the believers. He was not a witness to the, to the resurrection of Jesus himself. He put believers and faith followers to death. But then on the road to Damascus, he was confronted with Jesus himself. And Jesus said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I am the Lord. And Saul right there humbled himself. He was blinded. And then he was provided with the gospel, with the witness, the, the testimony, and he believed. And he became the greatest missionary that the Bible records. He transformed. He was transformed. He believed. He had faith. The impact of the resurrection upon Paul's life. So much so that the old man that he was died. And he was no longer known as Saul, the one who killed Christians, but Paul, the one who saved Christians, believers to Christ. 2 Secondly, the resurrection of Jesus validates everything he said and did. If Jesus had remained in the grave, we could question his claims and teachings, but his, but his resurrection confirms his identity as the Son of God and validates his teachings. It gives us confidence to trust his words and to follow his teachings. Irregardless of what Dan Brown might say, that he's living with his own family in France somewhere, there has never been any evidence to provide anything contradictory to the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection of Jesus, thirdly, gives us a new perspective on life. It reminds us that this world is not all there is. There is more than this world. There is life beyond this one, a life that is free from pain, from suffering, from death. This perspective helps us to live with an eternal mindset, prioritizing, hopefully, spiritual matters over temporal ones. This world wants us to take us in by what it offers oh, yeah. physically, yeah. emotionally, and even spiritually. Because the world that we live in is not just a physical world, it's just not an emotional world, but is it? Pardon me, is a spiritual world. It is a spiritual battle. You may not have wanted to come today, but unbeknownst to you, you're in a spiritual battle. The enemy doesn't want you to come here. He doesn't want you to be here. He doesn't want you to hear the truth of God's word, the truth of his resurrection, the truth of his love. Whenever the church gathers on a Sunday, whenever the church gathers together to proclaim and be the body of Christ, the enemy doesn't want you to be part of that. He wants you to stay home. He wants to get you interested in something else, something of more importance. Easter Sunday, Passover Sunday, this is great. We get to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But there's always been Good Friday. What's the significance of Good Friday? Jesus gave his life on Good Friday. Why? Because of sin. He gave his life for us because we're sinners. We've sinned. We've done wrong. We have evil in our hearts. And that wrath of God stands against sinners because we miss the mark. That's what sin is. We miss his mark. And without Jesus, we can never achieve God's standard of holiness or perfection. But in Jesus, when we receive Jesus and believe in Jesus, 
we are hidden in him. He cleanses us white as snow. The Holy Spirit comes to live within us and we become a new creation. And when the Father looks at us, he then sees his Son. He looks at us. He doesn't see the sin. He sees his Son because his Son died on the cross for our sin. And he was perfect without sin. So the sacrifice of Christ was received. And we believe that because we have Resurrection Sunday. Jesus rose the third day. The sacrifice was received. His sacrifice was received. The temple curtain was torn. And we can be at one with God. We have peace with him through the sacrifice, the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The resurrection of Jesus empowers us to live a victorious life. Because Jesus conquered death, we too can conquer the challenges we face in this life. Through resurrection power, we can overcome sin, temptation, and every form of evil. Walking with and through and in the Holy Spirit. The resurrection of Jesus creates a sense of urgency, hopefully, in us to share the good news with others. Mary Magdalene ran to tell the disciples about Jesus' resurrection. She just didn't walk. She didn't talk, stop at the corner store, sit in the park. She ran to go tell the disciples what had happened. Jesus rose just as he said he would. I've seen him with my own eyes. And they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. She insists, no, I've seen him. He is risen. And Jesus tells her, tell them I'll go meet them in Galilee. He's going to meet us in Galilee. Let's go. Ah, we'll see. We'll see. He meets them in Galilee. There's a testimony of the apostles, his disciples, 500 have seen him risen. And he ascends to heaven amongst them. He says, I'm going to a place to prepare for you. So when I come back, you and I will be together. But in the meantime, do what? Share this good news. Share my love. Share my resurrection with the world. Death no longer has its claws on you if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen? Yes. Great. Say goodbye, Wayne. Are we sharing goodbye, the good news of Jesus' resurrection? It's good news for us, but it's also good news for the world. It's a message of hope and love and eternal life. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, overcome with thankfulness, overcome with awe, overcome with the testimonies of our young ones this morning. We love you. We worship you. We want to serve you. Father, we pray for Abby and Calvin that your hand would be upon them mightily, that you would guide them into all truth, that they would remain steadfast by your side, that you would defend them, that you would follow your angels around them, and that they would always know you, always follow you, and always love you, Lord Jesus. Be with our young ones. Be a firm foundation for them. Never let them waver. But when you test them, when you give them trials, 
Holy Spirit, come upon them and give them direction. We pray that your spirit would be upon them strongly. And upon each one of us as we walk in this world that's not our home. That you created. That we push back the darkness. And that we invite others to be part of your kingdom. That they would know the power of a risen Lord and Savior that death cannot hold. Death is conquered. Sin is no more. Until the day that you return, Jesus, walk with us by the power of your Spirit. Be with us. Be in us. In front of us, behind us, beside us, above us, below us. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. There's a lot of things that the disciples didn't get. Even at the supper, when Jesus took his outer garment, wrapped it around himself, and served the disciples, washed their feet. They didn't understand. They did not understand. And just as what he's done for us, he's leaving us, he's left us instructions to serve well with one another as we know Christ. I've come to know the Lord Jesus much more than a friend, but we're going to sing this song because he's taken that unpersonalized part and he's come and he's given it us in our heart. A friend, would you like to stand with us?
again. with Jesus this morning that um, I encourage you to take that step this morning um, we had a young gentleman here Calvin testified to the fact that he was an atheist for five years at such a young age but that the truth of God's word does not return void if that's you Give God, give God a test. Say to him, you know, show me that you're real. He'll ask you to do some work on that. He'll ask you to open up his word. He'll ask you to test his word to see if it's not true. But he wants you more than you, than we want him. And that's a truth. We're created in his image to be his image on earth. And he died for you so that you and he would become one. May the Lord bless you, may he keep you, may he shine his face upon you, may you know the truth and the power of Jesus and his resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.